My fellow Hoosiers, for most of this year, we have been consumed by COVID-19 and its immense impact on our health and our economy. That's true for all of us as individuals, and it's certainly true for our state and local governments. And it continues to be the new normal that we manage our way through every day. Even as we follow the science and work relentlessly to stamp it out, this is clearly one of the most dangerous viruses in our lifetimes. I know this is hard. I know there is fatigue. I know people just want it to go away. I do too. It's required tremendous sacrifice. We've endured unimaginable loss. And I appreciate everyone's patience, resilience, and generosity through it all. Truly like never before, we're in this together. And that's why ultimately we will prevail together. That said, we're also facing another kind of virus that's equally voracious. And it's in turn forcing us to a reckoning as a state and nation, one that's built on equality for all. I'm talking about cases of racism, sometimes obvious, sometimes subtle, that have led to inequity and exclusion that have plagued our country throughout our storied history. We now stand at an inflection point. And we have an opportunity to acknowledge those past wrongs, learn from our history, and admit where we've come up short of our ideals. Then we must get about doing what we've done whenever we face a challenge, make historic progress together. It falls upon us, all of us, no matter how difficult the issue, how far away it may seem or easy to ignore. We, the people, together, marching toward the right, will determine our timely progress. Our country is unique in that we were founded on the promise that all men were created equal. As our founders wrote, endowed by their creator, with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet it's just a fact. The concept wasn't put into practice even before the ink was dry. Quite the contrary. Laws were established that classified African Americans as property and prevented women from voting. There's nothing equal about that. That's why some hundred years later, our nation fought a civil war, American against American, to determine if one state could decide whether it was legal to own another person. More than 24,000 Hoosiers died. Nearly 50,000 were wounded in the fight to prevent slavery from spreading like a virus into states and to preserve a united states. Thankfully, the Union perspective, our side, our state, our founding written principles prevailed. But that hardly leveled the playing field, even here, for years to come. Over the ensuing decades, anti-slavery states like Indiana still attracted those who thought their birthright gave them the right to carry out heinous acts of violence against those who didn't look or Pray the way they did. Lynching and burning down houses of worship were their means of sending messages of how it would be. Jim Crow laws kept people of color separate, prevented them from voting, and denied them equal treatment under the law. Think about it. It took 100 years after the Civil War to finally pass laws that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and prohibited racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. Now, for sure, there has been undeniable progress. 
We've seen people of color move into positions long denied them in business, including America's first female self-made millionaire, Indiana's own Madam C.J. Walker, and in education and in sports and in the arts and in government, including the election and re-election of a black president. And yet today, in 2020, it's clear. We must aspire to do more to form that more perfect union. The coronavirus has underscored stubborn racial disparities that are still with us, fueled by decades of unequal opportunity and structural barriers like job discrimination and access to good educations and health care. People of color are dying of COVID-19 at twice the rate of whites and are more likely to have lost their job during this pandemic. And it's in this environment that we've seen a number of unarmed black men and women killed, culminating in an officer kneeling on the neck of Mr. George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds until his last breath was snuffed out. I admit I can't put myself in a black person's shoes. I can't fully appreciate the everyday indignities and slights our friends and associates have had to deal with, let alone the fear of some things I've never had to think about for a second. So I've spent considerable time since Mr. Floyd's death connecting with and listening to black leaders and stakeholders. One conversation leading to the next and to the next and to the next. I've talked with and listened to mom and pop business owners, college presidents, law enforcement, corporate executives, church leaders, and everyday citizens, rural, urban, and suburban. Many have shared what's on their hearts and minds, and I've tried to do the exact same. One theme I heard over and over again was the importance of getting to root causes of inequities and not just reacting to the symptoms. Several people conveyed the sense that over our country's long history, inequity and exclusion have actually been ingrained in many of our institutions, systems and structures, often unknowingly. And while we have made progress, and we have, we haven't rooted it out fast enough. Gaps persist, and some are widening. Another thing I heard is to think about the big picture. Dr. Sean Huddleston, the president of Martin University, Indiana's only predominantly black institution, something we should all be proud of, said to me that while black lives matter, black livelihoods matter too. I agree on both accounts. Black lives matter, and so do black livelihoods. Dr. Huddleston said we must remove barriers to success so all can benefit and achieve their dreams without having to worry about how much privilege society has afforded them. Powerful. Another theme I heard is best captured by what Martin Luther King called quote, the fierce urgency of now, that we need to use this moment as an opportunity to forge a new, more inclusive future. We cannot lose this opportunity to act constructively. Dennis Bland, the president of the Center for Leadership Development, told me change is gonna happen. The key is to shape change. That's what I and my team intend to do, shape change. 